just make sure, yeah. Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life and all seasons, too. You know how much we were dependent on sunshine when it's this dark in the sanctuary. But we, we have the inner light that shines, and we are here together. It is so good. For this is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientations, gender identities, social and economic situations, and abilities, and politics. We advocate for human rights, and we strive in every moment to be good stewards of this earth. And in recognizing the relationships of which we are a part, we also take a moment in our service to recognize the land upon which we gather, for this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. Uh, we have been asked, we do as we have been asked to, to recognize the Peoria people for they and many nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. So we take a moment to recognize them for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. We recognize how much it means in our lives to gather, to expand our circles of care, to get to know one another. So I want to welcome folks who are joining us who are new or for the first time. We have lots of name tags. We welcome all the questions. And I really want to invite folks to come and get to know us after the service as well. We'll gather for coffee and treats in Fellowship Hall if you're joining us online. We also stay and have a little bit of a chat on Zoom as well. And as part of how we gather, I want to ask folks, if you can, to uh, set your devices to worship mode. There's so many devices these days. But we also recognize that some are for medical concerns and maybe aren't going to be in the quiet, that worship mode is like full-on mode. And that's OK, too. For today, I have a couple of notes. Uh, today, if, especially if you go into Fellowship Hall, which let me direct you to today, because today is our connection fair. We have a number of committees and groups um, and projects in the congregation, have tables all around the uh, exterior of the fellowship hall and want to talk with you about things, want to help people get to know what are all the things we do. I think one of the most important pieces, I mean, you know, by all means, sign up for things, go right ahead. Let's get her done. But what's also wonderful about the Connection Fair is simply that we get to see all so many of the good things that happen as part of this congregation. I think there's ways in which we just don't encounter uh, all the different pieces because there's so many. There's a lot of different range of projects and ways that we make the congregation happen. And the Connection Fair is one of those times to kind of bring it forth and make it easier to find and get to know. Also, uh, after service today, we have a Beyond Inquirers. How do we do church? What does that mean? in this congregation. You'll be in the conference room with Jesse Lachlan. Uh, next Saturday, I want to invite folks, if you're feeling a need to get out and about, maybe you don't have enough yard work of your own. Maybe you don't. Maybe you need some more in your life. And let me help you with that. Let us help you with that. No, in fact, actually, what we need are folks who are willing to come and do some work on the trails, in particular, uh, out in the Great Woods. Um, and we're doing that, one, because it's a good idea to do in the fall, and two, as part of our getting ready for the haunted forest. If you're not familiar with how we do a haunted forest, we do a haunted forest, and it attracts hundreds of people from the community. Woohoo! So a little bit of that is getting the woods ready to make them easier, make it easier for people to pass when it's completely dark. So we try to do that, too. Uh, see, Evan Stubbs, if you'd like to... Uh, learn more about the workday that is next Saturday morning. Bring gloves and your own gear, um, and we will find things to do. Also, in two weeks, and I can't quite believe it's in two weeks, but we have the great UU book sale is coming in two weeks, October 5th and 6th. We really could use folks to sign up and help, and boy, donations of books are welcome. If you needed a place to deposit things, 
this is a good place for the books, not the encyclopedias, though. I'm just going to say right now, don't do the encyclopedias. Find another home for those. Thank you. All right. And also part of what we do in uh, part of what we do in the early fall as we gather for the beginning of the year is kind of refresh our small group gathering. So for that, I want to invite Jeanette Gruber to say more. Thank you, Reverend. Joining us, this is the fall. And I have a really solid memory in the fall with the colors everywhere that are just about to break, right? They're coming real soon. One of the people in the circle of small group that I was in for several years had a pontoon boat and a little lake with fingers where you could go. And she invited us to come sit in a figurative circle on her boat, and she would guide us with the wheel up and down so we could see the golds and the red and the greens and the dark greens. And somebody finally said, hey, wait, there's a fish. And I might add, even though it's a little sailboat down here in front that I was able to find, the concept of floating together for a little while in a peaceful, calm water with a guide who doesn't tell you what to do, just keeps you safe, helps us to be kind to each other and lift up different topics each time we meet twice a month from September, excuse me, October 20th until about January 20th, we invite you to join a connection circle. These small groups make it so we start in the here and now, and we have the possibility of becoming just a little more close to a few people in our circle. Our sign-up date is September 22nd, basically. Excuse me, it's next Sunday. I'm not good with calendar math. And I offer a sincere invitation. We have a form, your name, your phone number, your email. Please join us. We're all new in a circle when we haven't met the other folks before, or maybe we met them just a little bit. So please know you speak when invited, you are quiet when you want to be quiet, and we find out just what color you like in the fall. Thank you, Jeanette. Yes, we're putting, we have some groups that are continuing, and we also have the potential for some new groups to be forming. I want to encourage folks to get connected with the congregation. A little circle of six to maybe 10 folks is such a great way to find those different, more direct connections in our world in general. And now let us turn to our opening hymn, number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. I invite you to rise and body your spirit. We're going to do a two-part round. We're going to sing together all once. Let me see. Kathy's going to play it through. We'll sing together once, and then we'll break it up into two parts for three times through that.
I invite Jean Burke forward for our opening words. We gather to draw a wider circle by Reverend Gretchen Haley. In a world that feeds on moral outrage, we are here to cultivate moral courage. In a time that prizes picking sides, we gather to draw a wider circle. And in a culture that teaches us to get for what we give and to ask what's in it for me, we come to practice generosity and to remember we are all in this together. In the midst of life's bitterness, we choose to sing and to give thanks, to laugh together, and to be keepers of beauty, to offer a place of belonging for all who come in gladness and in pain, to resist the push to the next moment and the next to slow down, to breathe more deeply, to feel a part of something greater for this hour. And in this space, let us be the change we wish to see come. Let us worship together. I invite Jean Jost forward for our chalice lighting. Good morning. This is called Soul Fire by Anastasi Bavos. As we light this flame of hope, may our congregation become a kaleidoscope of souls and people, an abstract flame-like pattern in bright gold colors and a black background. In the presence of this flame, in me, in you, in us, is an invitation to sit at the table. That invitation will be our coffee hour. May we tend our soul fire through these challenging and trying times to open the hearts and minds of all who enter our door. from my colleague, the late Reverend Mark Mosier, the wolf. Let there arise among us a spirit of compassion. Let our hearts be warm to the presence of our siblings, our fellow humans. May our memories be sparked to recall how nothing human is alien to any of us. In this hour of quiet reflection, May we be summoned to recognize our own pain, the pain of others, to offer kind hearts and willing hands to the service of the spirit and the human search for meaning. Let us enter into this time with our reflection and our music for meditation. During this time, you're welcome to come forward and light candles for what is in your mind and on your heart. And for those who are joining us online, let us let this candle light be you for you as well. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
Abraham Heschel reminds us. How prayer invites God to be present in our spirits and in our lives. And prayer cannot bring water to a parched land, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. In that sense, in that spirit, we gather for the sharing of joys and sorrows. Last week, we offered condolences for the Cordonaway family. Uh, Amy's, Amy Cordonaway's mother, Irene Dittmars, passed peacefully in the company of family uh, last Saturday night. We also want to recognize and offer that Irene's memorial will be at our church, <clears throat> at our church here um, at 1 p.m. on November 2nd. I want to turn to health, wishes for health. We offer uh, wishes for health and recovery to Nancy Venzon as she recovers from a successful surgery. In the service, we also offer condolences again for B.J. Lindsay that her uncle Lee died on September 13th in the Czech Republic after a long illness. Good thoughts are appreciated for B.J.'s aunt Susie, who has lost her life partner of 30 years. We also join BJ in recognizing her mother's memory. BJ's mother, Leslie Dobbins, would have turned 84 on September 14th. In our larger world, we recognize the celebration of the autumnal equinox, also known in the pagan tradition as Mabon. And that was celebrated yesterday here at the church by the keepers of the Great Grove. It was a wonderful potluck. And in our larger world still, we keep in our heart Amber Thurman and Candy Miller. They are two black mothers who died as, the, as a result of the abortion ban in Georgia. That was just figured out and finalized this week. We also keep in our heart those who were killed, injured, and frightened in Lebanon when Israeli forces turned phones and pagers into bombs. It is a sobering thing to be in the world Let us hold one more moment of quiet, knowing there is so much in our minds and hearts, names and milestones, joys and sorrows, personal and global. Let us hold one more moment in shared quiet among us and breathe. Amen. Shalom. 
Salam, and blessed be. I invite Jesse forward for our story today. Our story today is The Circles All Around Us by Brad and Christy Montague. We begin by drawing a circle on the ground right along each toe. A safe little place for just one person. Nobody in this circle but you. You could keep that circle closed to everyone but yourself, but that would be like a library with just one book on the shelf. So let us draw a bigger circle. including your family as well. Now you see what can happen in a circle full of care. It becomes a happier circle as more loved ones come to stay. And wouldn't it be even better if all your friends could come and play? So you stretch and draw your circle, even bigger than it's been, and let a few more people know that they are welcome to come in. The circle's all around us, everywhere we go. There's a difference we can make and a love we can all show. But there's still so many outside our circles who are different in all they do. Though it feels a little uncomfortable, we draw a bigger circle and include them too. It doesn't mean the circle's easy. It can get harder the more we share but wonderful things can happen when love is felt everywhere. As time passes, our eyes open and we see others we really care for. And that's when we ask ourselves, well, what's this circle really for? It's for us to create bigger circles around us the rest of our days and let our caring ripple out in millions of little ways. The circles all around us, everywhere we go, there's a difference we can make and a love we all can show. Our circles grow and grow, and we watch them wonder-eyed. And remember, the very first circle started with the love you hold inside. I wonder how much bigger your circle will get today. I invite the kids to join me back in religious education today.
in our congregation, we do so much to keep drawing circles of care around ourselves, around each other, and around the world. And how we do that is in part equipping ourselves with gifts of time and energy as well as money. And so in this moment, we take a collection during our service to make that a, a tangible act of that collection. We also give back a portion of our abundance into the world. We do a share the plate for half the undesignated collection goes to a monthly recipient. Um, and in this case, for this month, uh, the monthly recipient is 100 Black Men of Central Illinois. Uh, they provide services and programs for our African American community economics, seminars, health and wellness, and so on. And they have a wonderful mentoring for life program for our younger people, for youth ages 8 to 18, to help build and establish them as great agents in the world. So thank you for your generosity. We'll have, uh, please mark on the envelope or indicate uh, where you would like your gift to go. And we appreciate all of the gifts that are received. Now, I invite the ushers to please come forward. For our reading today, I want to draw from the, some of the responses that uh, I found on Facebook and uh, on our internal email group. You all were very kind in responding to my question, what does pastoral care mean to you? When has such care shown up in your life? So what does pastoral care mean to you, and when has that shown up in your life? And some of the responses included simply that spending time with people. I find it fascinating. You know, people are like, oh, you can talk to the minister like outside of worship. Yeah. Yes. It is not a bother. Come and find me. You know, the minister, the congregation, it's all about getting to know. Appreciate Sarah Allen. She was very kind. She says, while you, meaning me, are the qualified to provide the deepest UU philosophy and counseling, pastoral care may be provided by each of us through being aware of people in need of care, both emotional and physical. The burden shouldn't be yours alone or even yours in the caring committees. We all need to live our UU values. Thank you, Sarah. And certainly, certainly one of the most important times around pastoral care are times of crisis, especially death. Judith Corrin Shanahan talks about that on the care she received from after the sudden death of her daughter, how much the minister in Rockford showed up and the congregation showed up. She says, if it not had been for our minister and your family, I'm not sure I would have survived. So pastoral care involves the minister plus caring individuals. 
Ministerial visits are very important. Yes, calling ahead is needed. Yes, I will call ahead. I will not surprise you. Except in the dire emergency, then just show up. She says, I cannot underestimate how important those caring individuals were to me at that crisis time. The minister is first on the scene. I like that. It's a precious thing to be a first responder in that way. And the caring committee and the support staff and so on. And friends, people who are trusted individuals to help one get through illness or death. And Dave Grebner offers a comment on how much pastoral care is about the spiritual life and the journey as it unfolds, being a companion and strengthening one another while finding meaning and purpose. And my friend and colleague, Joy Berry, uh, talks about pastoral care as an inherent part of faith formation, that how we connect and how we keep connecting with one another in all times of life is part of, again, what Dave was talking about, that meaning-making, that journey, how we amplify and grow each other and with each other. So a few thoughts on pastoral care. I invite you to join me for our hymn number 1023. It's in the Teal Hymnal. We're just going to, I can't remember whether this congregation is familiar with this one. We're going to sing it through, listen to it once and sing through all together three times. There is a moment when the inspiration for the, for the sermon becomes part of the sermon and the story of itself. For September's theme of invitation, I wanted to take some time to focus on pastoral care. Because care in a religious community is, is so assumed and so essential. But we don't necessarily always talk about it or reflect on it in the larger congregational life. So one of the places this came up was in the five-year planning conversations from last winter. I asked about, I asked folks who were participating how to deepen the quality of care and the community in the congregation, in addition to the goals and aspirations being named. And you wanted that deepening. You were like, oh yeah, we need 
And then at the question box sermon at the end of August, so many of your questions were about spiritual searches, spiritual journey, wanting to nurture your own practice and nurture your own inner life. And there was a real wanting to be, again, connected. So we're going to take a little stab at some theology of pastoral care. And I will say right at the beginning that the theology of pastoral care, a theology, any theology of pastoral care, is not systematic. It's not well-ordered. It is, at its heart, discovered. One has to be open to the unexpected when unpacking pastoral care. And I had that gift upon me this time from just a standard uh, internet search, you know, pastoral care, Unitarian sermons. Let's see what shows up. I happened to find the sermon from my late colleague, the Reverend uh, Mark Mosier DeWolf. And in fact, it was entitled Toward a Theology of Pastoral Care. He delivered this message in 1986. 1986. And it was also two years before he died of AIDS at the age of 35. So he was 33 when he offered this message. I want to say a little bit more about him. Reverend Mark was brilliant and energetic and lived a full life. He grew up in the church, and he was the child of a well-respected minister, his father, Bill. He was the first openly gay minister in Canada. And keep in mind, this was in the late 70s and early mid-1980s that he is active in ministry, that he is entering what would have been just the beginning of his life and career. And then he became ill. But he continued to serve and advocate to the best of his ability. And this sermon, in fact, I'm going to share a little bit of it and the spirit of it. It came from the care he received when he fell deeply ill and the congregation he was with cared for him. After Mark's death in 1988, his father, the Reverend Bill DeWolf, gave his son's robes to First Church in Boston so the interns and students could wear them during worship. And I was one of those student ministers who benefited from the gift of Mark's robes. We lost so much during the AIDS crisis. And the legacy of how much we learned compassion in that time keeps showing up. Let me say a little bit more about pastoral care, where it comes from. Because the largest definition and understanding of pastoral is from the Christian tradition. And in our Unitarian Universalist roots on both sides, the Unitarian and the Universalist. The pastoral comes from the Latin word pastor, Latin for shepherd. In Christianity, it comes from the image of Jesus as a shepherd, tending to the existential and eschatological needs of the sheep and the flock. The shepherd is one of the most powerful images in religious cultural language. Unfortunately, is one that's so often evoked for the good, care and compassion. To me, it says care and compassion during life's hardships or when we are lost is at the heart of why humans gather in religious community. And the presence of the shepherd, I find, like many, I find the presence of the shepherd watching day and night is reassuring to so many people. You know, one of my favorite sets of characters in the nativity story at Christmas are the shepherds. 
who witness and travel and witness the baby. Now, Jesus didn't keep this whole image of the shepherd for himself in the teachings of the Bible. He was charging his disciples with this care as well. You must go out and go forth. One thing I, I learned that I'm going to say I was surprised to learn about pastoral is that it's not simply care from compassion, which is powerful enough. Some of the Catholic resources I found in this gave me a different definition. In, their, in that frame, being pastoral is making sure the people follow the liturgy and the scripture and the obligations of the tradition. This was a good clarif clarification of what pastoral is not in Unitarian Universalism. My function as pastor, because that's one of the functions, is not to make sure you're following certain rituals and traditions. I just want to be clear. That's not the pastor. I appreciate in Jewish traditions how care for one another, pastoral care, if you will, is a mitzvah. It's both a commandment and a blessing. And it's something that we all should do for each other. This kind of mitzvah is one for everyone. We are called to tend to each other, and doing so is good for each of us and for all of us. I think in Unitarian Universalism, we're probably more in kind of the the Jewish spirit of that word, that each of us and all of us caring for one another. But I will also say that in Unitarian Universalism, it's not so much tending sheep as herding cats. You might have heard this one before, but I'm going to tell you, this one's really applicable. And I love the cats. I love all the cats. You know, many folks resist the image of Jesus as a shepherd because it doesn't speak to them or they have really negative connotations. And theology as obligation doesn't really make sense in that spirit. But as I said, Reverend Mark offered that the Jewish tradition is much closer to you, that mutuality. But also what's true, and as I said kind of at the beginning about Theology of pastoral care is not systematic. Theology of pastoral care, as Mark tells me, is not rational. We don't have a reason, but we care anyway. We care because we just do. From the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, the heart has its reasons, which reason knows nothing of, we know the truth not only by the reason, but by the heart. We do this simply because we are moved to, independently and collectively. And the independent part, the individual part, this is certainly an inherent part of our practice, of our human experience, but also in Unitarian Universalism. We are seekers. We are individuals each engaged with our own exploration and discovery, our own struggles in life, our own challenges. I think from an individual perspective, pastoral care is present uh, and needed because an individual is seen, is known, is regarded as worthy. The one person is that individual unit in the community. We have such, it occurred to me as I, re, I was driving over here, that part of what the, the wish for pastoral care, the need for it, it, sometimes it's hard to express and hard to define those expectations of it, is how much we experience isolation. How much harm and grief and sorrow and illness is so isolating. And in that sense, kind of dislocating. And how often, I know for myself, 
I know for you, for many of you, how much you're like, I just need something to hold on to. Can someone please find me? That is certainly at the heart of pastoral care. You matter, and I matter, and to me, one of the most compelling images, I'm just going to keep with the Jesus and the sheep moment for just a little bit longer, hang in there if it doesn't work for you, but is the tending to every sheep. I feel like I am doing my job when I am fully present with one of you, not for job satisfaction, but because I know it matters. It matters to you that you're treated with respect and attention. And watching you all do the same with each other, because you do, is so moving. It's so moving when you find each other. And it feels like part of the world is in alignment. And just as much as we are many variations of cats, we also are profoundly interconnected. We are interdependent. We are entwined. We are relational as well as rational. We are part and parcel of this human community and this earth. Reverend Mark has something to say about this. I want to share what he wrote because it's, I find it particularly good. This congregation, this congregation is a freely gathered group of seekers after truth. We admit to ourselves and the world that truth is an evolving thing, that our understanding of meaning changes in time, and that we support each other in seeking the meanings of change and how it brings change in our lives. We are not a faith whose revelation was sealed with the deaths of the founders and the prophets. Rather, we are agents of transformation for each other. The way we share in this congregation our thoughts, our dreams, our loves, our fears, our hopes, our visions for the future are the stuff of which real, real religion is made. It is here with each other that we put together fragments of our experience into a vision of hope and world service. Our understanding grows as we grow, and to grow most completely, we need each other. I believe that human beings are agents of revelation to each other, he says. What differentiates Unitarian Universalists from other seekers after truth is how we do this with each other, how we covenant together laterally, relationally. We need community in ways to grow as human beings, as complete people. And this influences our reason for doing pastoral care, why we do pastoral care in particular. We aren't feeding helpless lambs or following ancient commandments, he says. Rather, we are tending the altar fires of revelation. When we meet each other in our suffering, we meet each other face to face with the ultimate reality. When we meet each other in our joy, we meet each other face to face with ultimate reality. For where we find the mystery that some people call God is not only in ancient books, not only on mountain vistas, not only in the ocean's roar, but more often in the face of a fellow human being. I agree with him. We are indeed agents of revelation for each other, with each other. I want to share a little bit about when I've seen this and when I found pastoral care for myself. Now keep in mind, if you would, that I haven't been near my side of my family since I left Massachusetts for my first ministry in Alabama in 2000. My mother keeps hoping, and I've been trying, but it's not going to work. <laughs> For most congregations, still, it's still something not common 
for a minister to be pregnant. That's still kind of newish, even amongst RUU churches on occasion. So when I was pregnant with my first child, and I was not anywhere near my family, and I started to be visibly so, especially because I was visible. Mm -hmm. Yep. I loved the Sundays when I attended my husband's congregation. There was this small flock of grandfathers. And usually, one at a time, during coffee hour, they would come up to me and ask how I was doing. They simply shared joy and care for me and with me. I was so touched. And they were clearly acting out of love. Now, care showed up in a different way, I'll say, when I was pregnant with baby number two. In my ministry in Fort Worth, care showed up uh, from there was a, a group, small, a few women who were retired labor and delivery nurses. Strong people. Their care showed up in making sure the church baby shower was not too close to my delivery date. I was fine. I was more than fine. But I was like, okay, I'm just going to go with what you think is right. So that was care as well. In this moment, in this current time, I am grateful for the ability to help my father and to help my family with his care as we find a way through his cancer diagnosis. Because this isn't about curing that cancer. It's about the quality of life for as long as he has. And we don't know how long. But I'm very glad I was able to be with him a little over a week ago. Uh, with my brothers for what might be his last birthday. Even as well-resourced as my brothers and I are, finding the way forward to be present with him, to care for him, to sell the house, is unknown territory for a journey we didn't want in the first place. But being with you through your times of illness or your life-changing care needs for selling and moving and unloading stuff, I have heard you in the struggle and the frustration and the grief. I have heard you in the moments when there's too much and there is no end in sight. From remembering with you, talking about memorials, getting ready for those, the thinking about that fleeting, irreplaceable spark in the person that we are cherishing and grieving. What matters most and how is what, what we find what matters most and how to tell the truth of it. From all this and more, I am a better daughter and a sister with my family. I listen better. I offer another perspective when we are puzzled, and my brothers do the same. We are agents of revelation for each other. And I'll tell you, it is, whenever somebody tells me they have felt cared and tended, it is, that's also pastoral care. That's also revelation. Pastoral care is nearly the most subjective and nebulous element of ministry, while it is also just about the most important. Whether as a minister or a member, we don't know the impact of most of what we do. We just don't. And expectations amongst people vary from situation to situation, from person to person, depending on personalities and history and so on. In my world, I have every expectation from, can't the minister know that I'm already in the hospital, that I don't tell them? To, 
Why is the minister paying attention to me? I really have the range. And that's the nature of it. That just is. And so myself and the congregation and the care committee, we try, but we also falter and fail. And pastoral care can be so uneven. And I'm going to say being failed by folks who are ignored, I know it's one of the worst feelings. And it's one that's hard to move on from and find trust again. I just really wanted to acknowledge that. But I hope. Because revelation isn't always onward and upward. Revelation is all, sometimes is like, oh, crud, we forgot. Or, oops, I didn't. And, oh, I never got the message. That's revelation too. And I hope, and the caring committee hopes, that when we miss the mark, please tell us. And tell us what might help you feel heard and seen. The theology of pastoral care is so much of the heart, of making no sense, of making every sense because we need it. It's so much about what is possible, what we can do, and what we might not. It's about connection and mobilizing. I love that Judith Corrin Shanahan pointing out. It's about mobilizing and caring for each other, how that comes in so many moments, particularly when we can set ego and approval aside and simply are there are simply present. They're profoundly interconnected, entwined. And I'm going to offer that in the end, the past theology of pastoral care is simply the practice, which is the best kind of theology, actually doing it. So let us go forth, as Mark DeWolf tells us, to continue to be these agents of revelation in our care and our love, that we may do so for each other, with each other, that we may then go out and do and offer the same to the world. Amen. Please join me for our closing hymn, There is Love. It'll be a slide up on the screen, and we will sing it through entire, we'll sing it through once and sing it through the whole time twice, or twice. Yes.
had to be a little careful there. That flame was a little hard to extinguish. I guess that's the whole point. Uh, <laughs> Move through the, through the World in Love by Reverend Maggie Lovins. We extinguish this flame, but not its meaning and mission in our hearts. Our time together has come to an end. Go in peace, be of service to one another, and may you move through the world in love for all your days. From my colleague, the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage. For deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>